Our second scripture today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 to 43. Now, in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. <coughs> When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with a request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. How do we define human life? It's a big political issue these days, isn't it? It's being raised in state laws being passed all over the place. It's also a religious issue, and it continues to be a scientific issue. And of course, all of that means it's a legal issue on top of all of that. We've seen in recent months lots of anti-abortion laws passed around the country, some making abortion illegal as early as six weeks into the pregnancy, some of which criminalizing abortion so that if a woman has an abortion, she is guilty of murder, as is a physician who does that procedure. There is even one law, and I forget off the top of my head which state it is, that can criminalize miscarriage if it can be shown that the woman's behavior led to the miscarriage. Of course, the other end, we have states that have passed laws that allow assisted suicide from physicians. It's understood almost everywhere that an individual can refuse treatment for himself or herself, even if in that refusal they are guaranteeing that they will die. And in many circumstances, or under many circumstances, one can make that same decision for someone else. <coughs> we saw Ashley yesterday. We also had the prayer request that we sent out earlier this week about her cousin, they took him off life support and then turned to his brother and asked if they wanted any interventions done after that. He had a decision to make that inevitably meant life or death. So what does it mean to be a living human being? It's not a simple question. The answers are not simple. But it was clear for Tabitha. She's a fun character. It's the only female in the New Testament who is specifically referred to as a disciple of Jesus. Now, the assumption is there were lots of them. We know that as Jesus traveled around and he had his band of people that were called his disciples who were following him, we know that there were women in that group and, and so we just assume, well, of course, they were called disciples. But in Tabitha's case, we have a woman who is specifically named as a disciple of Jesus. She was important enough in her little community in Joppa that when she died, they had heard that Peter, this leader in the church, this one of whom had been one of Jesus' closest followers, was in a, a nearby town. They hear Peter's there. When, when, when Tabitha dies, they call for him to come. 
It doesn't seem as if they expected her to intervene. When you read the passage, it looks like she's already dead when they call for Peter to come. But the intent then seems clear, at least to me, that they wanted Peter to come and honor this important woman in their community. They wanted him to come so that he could bless the body before she's buried. They wanted him to come so he could hear the stories of this important woman and join with them in mourning her loss. So Peter comes. Maybe he had heard about this woman before, we don't know. But in any case, the message comes, Peter, we need you to come. This pillar of our community has passed. Would you please come and be with us as we grieve and as we honor her? So Peter comes, and he finds the body surrounded by the community of women. They had washed and laid out her body in the room upstairs. And, and as Peter arrives, they began to show him various garments that Tabitha had made for them. Now, for most of us, that's not something that really strikes us as, as particularly important. I don't know about you, but I've got way too many shirts. I've got shirts I haven't worn in years. What's that uh, Japanese woman's name? She says I should throw them away because I'm not wearing them. Yeah, where you kind of? Well, my, my closet would still be overly full, even after I threw away all the ones that I haven't worn. But in the ancient world, a garment was a really, really precious thing. A piece of clothing represented literally hundreds of hours of work. Spinning, weaving, sewing, all of that by hand. The poorest people were lucky if they had two or three garments. And many of them literally had only one. I remember the first time I was struck by that. We were traveling through the countryside in Haiti, and we looked there in these little streams coming down out of the mountains, and here were women standing in the streams naked, washing their single dress. First time I ever even thought about it. Took it for granted. Clothes. But here, as these women are showing Peter the garments that Tabitha had made for them, they were showing him something precious, something that involved a tremendous amount of work and of giving of herself. And then there is the second detail. The women gathered, we're told, are the widows. Women in that society without any means of self-support, literally on the margins of society and dependent upon others. They become a key feature in the early church, the widows, because everybody else let them stay at the margins of society, but the church said, no, 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 these people are part of our community, these women are important parts of who we are, and so they pulled them in and became known for caring for those who were on the margins. And here we see this earliest days of the church. Tabitha is beginning that tradition. She is saying, these women are part of who we are, and I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to make garments for them so they have clothing to wear. And so there we've got these women, and they're, they're, they're coming to Peter, and I can see these, these little old ladies grabbing him and kind of pulling and saying, let me show you. Let me show you. This, this cloak, this cloak, Tabitha made it for me two years ago. You remember? That was the year that it was so cold that winter, and I just, I just couldn't stay warm. And Tabitha made this for me. And, 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 and when I wrapped it around myself, I felt warm, not only because the garment kept me warm, but because I knew and I felt Tab Tabitha's love in that garment. She made it for me. And, and then another woman said, Oh, Peter, Peter, look, look, look at the fine needlework on this gown. Tabitha made it for my daughter. She wore it when she was baptized. My son wore this tunic day in and day out. One day he fell and tore it. It was the only garment he had. He was so afraid he didn't come to me to show me the tear. He went to Tabitha. 
and she repaired it. You have to look very closely, but you can see the stitches right here. He's long since outgrown it, but we're holding on to it for the next little boy in our family who will wear it just as our son did. The stories flow on and on, stories of spinning and weaving and sewing wrapped up in the spinning and weaving and sewing of the women's lives. Tabitha had been alive because she touched the lives of those around her. They knew in and through her the very touch of Jesus' hands. She was a disciple of Jesus, we're told, because his work continued in her work. Peter sends them all out of the room, and I'm guessing they expected he was going to pray for her, maybe, maybe lay his hands on the body, maybe bless the body. Maybe, maybe they thought he's, he's embarrassed because he's going to cry, and he doesn't want us to see it. He's heard these stories of this amazing woman, and, and he just can't, and he doesn't want us to see that. So maybe that's why he's taking, pushing us all out of the room. But he goes in, and he pushes everyone out, he closes the door, and, and a few minutes later, he opens the door. And I, I love the text here. It says, he showed her to be alive. And, and I have to wrestle with, what in the world does that mean? Does that mean Peter walks out of the room and Tabitha's walking out behind him? In, in my imagination, that's not what I see happening here. Because for, for Tabitha to be alive meant something different than just being able to walk out of the room. And for the people, people who knew her, just seeing Tabitha breathing wouldn't have told them this is really Tabitha who's back. It could have just been a reanimated bunch of flesh. They would need to see Tabitha at work, and that's what I imagine. I imagine Peter comes out of the room and he says, come on, come on back in. And, and the mourners are, are starting to go back in and they're figuring, okay, now we can finish preparing the body and then we can take it and remove it for burial. And they walk into the room and because they're sitting in the corner in her chair is Tabitha. This is Tabitha. And they know it's Tabitha because she's knitting. She's working on a shawl. And she looks up at her friends who are standing there dumbfounded. And she says, what are you doing? See that skein of yarn there? I need that. Could you hand that to me? I, I've fallen behind. And I'm almost out of yarn. Just breathing isn't enough. At least not for the abundant life that was promised by Jesus. And that was his promise. You remember that. I've come to bring life and bring life abundant. Much of the time, many of us kind of go through life as if on autopilot. I think Henry David Thoreau was wrong when he said most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Quiet, perhaps, song still in likely, but less likely in our society, quiet desperation than just boredom. We get on the hamster wheel and we run and we run and we run don't have any idea where we're going or why. So how do we know that we're alive? When do we feel most alive? How do others know that we're alive? Some folk only feel alive when they're on the edge, skydiving, skiing down a, a double black diamond mountain, picking a fight on a street cor corner, going home with a stranger from a bar. We may know folk who fit some of those categories. But that's obviously not what Jesus meant when he said life abundant. It's not what Peter demonstrated with Tabitha. So what does it mean? I think it begins with an experience of the presence of God each and every day. And that comes in all kinds of ways. It, it might come just as we look at the faces of the people we pass on the street might come in the majesty of creation around us. I'm so blessed. I have the most amazing commute of 
anybody in the world. And one evening this week, and I forget which evening it was, I, I have to admit, it's probably not the safest thing. I find myself peeking out over the ocean as I drive along the Gaviota Coast. And, and I look out, and I see this huge black thing splash, and this huge splash. I didn't get to see the whole breach, but I saw the end of a whale breaching. And I was on the wrong side of the road, or I would have pulled over and just sat and watched. I was headed, headed back home. And my breath left. And I thought, God is good. Sometimes we experience the presence of God in that small voice that comes to us at the still point of our heart. And we find ourselves in touch with a sense of wonder, of gratitude, of the holy. But that is never enough for being alive. We have to go the next step and find those unique gifts and dreams and possibilities that are ours alone and embrace them and then use them for others. Preaching professor Frederick, Frederick uh, Beekner says, the place where God calls you to be is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to be is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. I'm not sure that's always the case. I think sometimes God calls us to places where it's anything but deep gladness. But, as often as not, that's a good place to begin. Clearly, that was it for Tabitha. Each stitch, each spin of the spinning wheel, each throw of the shuttle on the loom, I can see her smiling and imagining the face of the person who would be touched by her work. Whatever we can give, hospitality, a listening ear, a loving visit, a piece of homemade pie, hand with some work, even a check, show that we can be fully alive as we bless others. And so the question the passage raises is when and where do we feel God's voice calling us? Where does our joy and the needs of the world intersect? How can we work to make the world a whole place? Um, last week, last weekend was a, an event for the Interfaith Initiative, and we sang a Jewish song, Tikkun Olam, which uh, in various Jewish traditions has very different meanings, but in the more progressive side of Judaism it means fixing the world. The role that all of us have in partnership with God to make the world a better place. And the implication is that God can't do it alone. That God requires us to be part of that. I think Tabitha was right on target. She was right on target. And that when we are most alive, that is when the work of Jesus continues in and through us. And when we do that work, the work of Jesus, then we are shown to be alive to all of those around us. Amen. Mm -hmm.